Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Good morning, church. Today is Pentecost Sunday. As we praise and worship, let us welcome the Holy Spirit. Although we are separated during this MCO period, may the Holy Spirit permeate and fill our hearts and our home this morning. Amen. Thank you. 
His face shine upon you. Be gracious to the Lord. Turn His face toward you. Church, thank you, Brother Matthew, for leading us in worship this morning. As you all know, today is Pentecost Sunday, which is 50 days after Easter, and it, it the pouring outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. But this morning, we will not be looking at Acts 2, but we will be looking at John chapter 4, 1 to 15. Jesus. Samaritan and the living water. Why don't we just pray? Lord, we thank you for this morning that your word is powerful. Your word is able to speak to us. We're able to reveal the thoughts, intentions, even dividing between the soul and the spirit. And I pray that as we listen to your word, let your word bear forth fruit. 30, 60, 100 for bless your people. Lord, touch us, Lord, even as we listen to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You have your Bibles, you can turn to chapter John chapter 4. Otherwise, it will appear in your screen as well. Verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw the water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it itself, himself, and did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. This is the word of God. And before uh, I start, I need to ex give a little bit of background, uh, context in this passage. Uh, in this passage, you notice that Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman. And in verse 9, the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So this, who are the Samaritans? The Samaritans are Israelites that have intermarried with foreign people. In 722 BC, the uh, Assyrians have conquered, taken over northern Israel. So they have deported some Israelites away. And they have also bring in, you know, bring in uh, foreigners, people from surrounding countries. As a result, the Israelites living there intermarried with them and also adopted uh, the foreign gods. They also they worship Yahweh, but they also worship other gods as well. So because of that, the Israelites despised the Samaritans because they have um, disobeyed the commandments of God. They intermarry with other uh, race and they adopted their god. So Samaritans are despised by the, by the Israelites. All right? They're like second class. Um, besides that, women, you know, women are also below men 
in the social status. Um, women are normally confined to private roles, uh, especially the home. And if they go out, they need to wear a veil as a sign of modesty and submission to men. So when any man meet a woman in the streets, in public, you know, you're not allowed to greet them, to say hello to them. Even if you meet your own family members, your mom, your sister, your auntie, you're not allowed to greet them. Um, even uh, a rabbi, a saying of the rabbi is like this. I would rather burn the Torah than to give it to women to read. So that's how they, they view uh, women. That is how women has been degraded. But now Jesus came. You know, he came to Samaria. If you look at the map, Jesus is going from Judea towards uh, Galilee, from the south to the north. So a typical Jew will not pass through Samaria. They will purposely cross over to the east side, to Peria, to go up to Galilee. But Jesus, he went cut straight uh, to Samaria. In verse 4, the Bible says that Jesus had to pass through. It comes with a meaning like there's an urge, there's a compulsion, there's a mission for God, for Jesus himself to go through Samaria. And Jesus not only went against one, uh, one tradition, but two you know, toxic, uh, degrading, dishonoring tradition against the Samaritan and against uh, women. And Jesus does not, did not come to establish tradition, practice, and cultures. That's all good. You know, all good for us. Uh, different race has different culture. But primary thing Jesus, Jesus came is to teach us to build, to restore the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And likewise, we have also our own Samaritans over here, wherever we are, wherever you are living in. There might be people or races that you, we may not like or we may have bitterness or grudges against them, uh, maybe because of certain uh, policies or certain things that uh, prevent us from having equal opportunity in work or education. But I believe God wants us to uh, go beyond that, go beyond our personal uh, prejudice, go beyond our personal lenses and see people from His point of view. And the Bible says God so loved the world, every one of us, no matter what our skin colour, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Amen? And, as, and even all this um, racism and um, governance based on race, I feel that it is not of, of the Lord. The devil come to steal, kill and destroy and to disunite people. But Jesus come to restore and to build bridges no matter what our skin colour is. And if we look down at certain uh, race or certain uh, people, certain uh, culture or religion, we are actually looking down at people who are made in the image of God. How can we uh, devalue those whom God honour? Uh, and besides uh, overcoming our barrier, overcoming even uh, bitterness in our hearts, God wants us to go one step further. He wants us to reach out to them. If you realise uh, Jesus did not just sit down at the well, He initiates a conversation. He take the first step. And I believe we must take the first step. We are called to be light and salt of the world. Uh, in this, to be caught in this world of darkness. And Jesus is very uh, clever, of course. He starts with a question. You know, sometimes in our uh, passion and desire to reach out, when I was younger, I want to reach out to my friends. So usually, I would just be straightforward, you know. We are all sinners. When we die, where we go. But Jesus loves us. Jesus loves you. He can save you and you know, He uh, saves you to go to heaven, to have eternal life. And my friend would just say, hmm, yeah. Um, and I, I think that 
is not really effective to um, help the other person, to help the other uh, pair of friends to think of the Lord. In this case, the Bible, Jesus used a question. And there is a lot of um, strategy, a lot of ideas that is out there that we can really uh, adapt into our own lives, our own personal lives to reach out to, to those around us. In, if you know explosive evangelism, there's, there are uh, certain questions to enable, to ignite that, that uh, thought about God. One of the questions they, they use is, uh, if you meet God, why, what will you say so that He let you into heaven? So we need to encourage all of us, you know, we need to find out ideas to reach out to those uh, around us. Different people, different cultures have different ways uh, we can reach out to them. And we, and we don't have to wait for uh, a church or anyone to create a program. We can do it ourselves individually, even among, uh, with our family members. And, you know, we are not, uh, we are a minority, which means that it's a good thing. We have more chance, more opportunities. Seven or eight out of ten people need to know the Lord. Would you agree with me? Even now in this COVID-19, I think it's far more easier for us to initiate conversations about eternity. Let's jump to verse 10. Jesus answered her, If he knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Second point is the gift of God. This is not just a gift that comes from God. You know, when we give a present to somebody, we just it comes from us. But this gift is not from God. This gift is of God. It means that it is of the essence of God Himself. You know, God gave Himself to us. And you know what the gift of God is? In this passage, it is the, it's the Holy Spirit. Yes, you know, in Luke 11, it says that how much more the Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. Amen. In the Old Testament, you know, the presence of God dwell on the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is hidden in the Holy of Holies. There's a Holy of Holies, Holy Place, and the Outer Court. And the Holy of Holies, only the high priest, not any priest or Levite, the high priest can enter once a year on the Day of Atonement to atone for the sins of the people. And the, there's a curtain that separates the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. And that curtain I read, it's about nine centimeters thick. Well, how thick that is. Um, how holy and how uh, pure the presence of God is. And when Jesus died on the cross, He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He says, it is, it is finished. And when He bowed, He said and gave up, his, gave up His spirit. The Bible says, the curtain, the temple was torn in two. The curtain was torn in two. What does that mean? It means that we have now free access, direct access to God, direct access to His presence through Jesus Christ. It's just like you, you have a telephone, direct access to the president, you know. Uh, sometimes I watch movies, the family members of the president will have direct access to him. In the same way, you know, church, we have direct access to the Father. You know, God is so holy, so majestic, so glorious. You know, in heaven, 24 hours, the angels and creatures and elders bow before Him. You know, just, they cry, holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty, 24-7 He's being worshipped. And who are we? Well, we are sinners, saved by grace, uh, fragile, human, made of dust. And the fact that God can dwell not just among us, but dwell in us 
Wow, that, that should make us one, uh, wonder. W-A-N-D-E-R. Oh, sorry. W-O-N-D-E-R. Wonder and in amazement. Oh, how, what price He has paid so that the Holy Spirit can dwell in us. And, you know, you don't have to wait for uh, anointed speaker, pastors, evangelists to pray over you to receive Holy Spirit. No need. Oh, they are all good. But you and I, we have direct access to the Holy Spirit. Even in your home, we, we don't even have to come to church to receive the Holy Spirit. You can receive that at home, you know, wherever you are. Wherever you are. Um, and this is what the prophets and uh, prophets of old has been talking about. Where in Jeremiah 31 verse 33, he says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. He will put his law within us and write it on our hearts. And these are the things which angels long to look. Amen. So I, I hope that we can all treasure and value the gift of God, the Holy Spirit that is inside each and every one of us. Amen. Next, the Holy Spirit you know, is also described as living water here in chapter 10. He would have given you living water. Why is the Holy Spirit described as a living water here? Okay, why do you drink water? Because you are, because you are thirsty, because I am thirsty. In the same way, we have a thirst that is deep inside our heart, deep inside our spirit, that cannot be quenched by, by the things of this world. This is a quote by Blaise Pascal. What else does this craving and this helplessness, the empty print and trace, this he tries in vain to fill with everything, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, which is God himself. And there is this longing inside all of us, inside mankind, need. And I would like to reckon, what, what need is this? You know, I would like to say that this need is the need for, for love. We can be coined, or you know need as acceptance, as a need to belong, but it's a need for love. And those who have not known the Lord, you know, they may find it in their family members, their spouse, club, friends. It's all okay. You know, they are good love, good kind of love. But their love cannot feel this emptiness, this longing, this desire in our heart and in our soul. And you know the song, um, There is a longing only you can feel Her raging tempest only you can still My soul is thirsty, Lord to know you as I'm known, drink from the river that flows before your throne. Sing with me. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've never been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I long to be deeper in love. And this is the love of God that we need. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, God is love. Why don't you say it together? God is love. And we need love, which means that we need God. Only God himself 
can feel us. And this love is, in, in the Greek, is the agape love. Why don't you say it together? Agape love is the unconditional, self-sacrificial, unending, so high, so deep, and so wide is the love of God. If you know, uh, there is this song called the Reckless Love of God. It caused some uh, discussion, all right? But I would like to uh, explain a little what uh, the songwriter means by this reckless love of God. God Himself is not reckless. His love is. His love does not consider Himself first. He doesn't wonder what He will lose by putting Himself out there. So the reckless love is not saying God is reckless, but His love is self-sacrificial. He does not think of Himself first, but He put others first, like in Philippians 2. Jesus did not count the equality with God something to be grabs, but He laid His life down for all of us. Romans 5, 5 says, God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit channels God's love to each one of us. Wow, the love of God, so powerful, so wonderful. And many times when the Lord touched us for the first few times, He always or maybe many times, He always comes to us with His love first. He never condemns us. He never makes us feel guilty. He convicts us with love. And this woman, what goes inside a woman that has been divorced five times, the Bible says, or Jesus says, you have five husbands before this, and now you are li- the one you are living with is not... It's not your husband. I can uh, think that she, she has been broken many times. She has been rejected. But in this last relationship, probably she wants, she's she long for love, but maybe afraid of uh, rejection. But Jesus come to fill her heart with living water, come to fill her soul with joy to fill her heart with peace. And sometimes you and I, we go through a situation and things in our lives. It can be childhood or it can be when we are growing up. Things that hurt us or things that um, make us disappoint uh, disappoint us. And there is this book called Healthy spirituality. All right, I got there, right? Emotionally healthy spirituality. Where he says that we can be spiritual, but sometimes our emotions may not be healthy. So this uh, author, or Pastor Pete Cesaro, uh, write a book, do videos to encourage Christians to be healthy in our emotions. Just like Nehemiah uh, built the, the wall. You know, the, the temple was already built, but the wall was broken. So the wall signifies the, the soul, the part of our emotions that needs rebuilding, needs healing. And Jesus come even to give us that. And if you uh, remember certain times in your life that uh, have hurt you or feel disappointed, you know, Jesus can come to heal you. Even right now, Lord, I just pray for the healing of your people, those who have gone through uh, emotional battle or abuse, that your, that your love will heal them and touch them um, in Jesus' name. My next point. John 4 verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty or come here to draw water again. I would like to paraphrase what she said in this verse. Sir, give me this water. Spiritual gift so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So it's easy for me. In other words, sir, give me this spiritual gift, so it's easy for me, so it's convenient for me. Unknowingly, uh, she's saying that, give me spiritual things so I can live a comfortable life. Give me spiritual things so I can 
live a convenient life. I think we can learn something here. Do we have that kind of mindset? We think, oh, Jesus comes to give us abundant life, blessings, so that we can live a good life, a better life, and it stops there. Is it just like that? Uh, do we just have a good life, or do we receive Jesus to have a good life, good family, work, and, and just retire? I believe there's more to that. Would you agree with me, church? There's more to that. Uh, in Genesis 12, verse 2, God says to Abraham, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. Well, there is a purpose for God's blessing. There is a purpose that God gave His Holy Spirit to us. In John 17, verse 20, I do not ask for this only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. And the key word is through. As we receive the, the, the Lord, as we receive the Holy Spirit, uh, His blessing does not just stop there. No, His blessing, God wants His blessing to flow through us, flow in us. You know, in, in this uh, chapter also, in verse 14, Jesus said that the water I will give Him will become in Him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. No, this spring of water must flow out to those around us, must flow out in our attitude, our actions and our words. And I'm not condemning anyone. All of us need to grow. All of us need to be, need to be Christ-like, follow after the image of God. And you know, there is this uh, song, The Blessing. Brother Matthew just sang, lead us in that song. The Lord bless you, may His face shine upon you and give you peace. This blessing does not only stop at us, but it comes in us and through us, just like the water. The Dead Sea is dead because there is no water flowing from there. And I, I pray you know, I, that God's water, God's Holy Spirit will flow in and through each and every one of us. Amen. Let's read verse 19 to verse 24. The woman said to him, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship at this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. She was referring to Mount Gerizim, which is built by Sanballat, who go against Nehemiah. So this temple was built about 450 BC. Why? Because the Jews rejected the Samaritans from helping them to rebuild the temple. So they built their own temple in Mount Gerizim. And um, interestingly, where, where the well is, is at Sychar. At this moment, the name is Askar. You can uh, go to Google and search A-S-K-A-R, I believe. At the, at the well, they can actually see the physical mountain there. Okay? So in verse 21, Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you worship the Father, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we know. Salvation is from the Jews. The hour is coming, it's now here. The true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. My last point, worship spirit and truth. Worship in its uh, basic meaning, if you look up, I look up in the Greek word, uh, proneskio, something like that. It means to bow, the bow in reverence, and also to kiss, which means that there is a respect and there is a love for God. There is a reverence, there is also a delight a joy in worship. And I, one English word that is really suitable is adore. Adore. Where we really adore God in reverence and in love towards Him. And that is how you know, we should come before God. You know, every time we worship Him, Lord, I reverence You. I respect You. And I love You. Amen.
In the Old Testament, uh, the God commanded Moses to speak to people or to, about all kinds of offerings. In the Old Testament, they bring offerings of grain and animals as worship unto God. Uh, but, and, and the intention, God intends actually the, that worship, the physical form of worship, actually translate, uh, create in them a heart of reverence, a heart of uh, adoration. But apparently, uh, it didn't, that did not happen. You know, people... This, uh, they bring to God their worship, but their heart is far from them, from God. In Isaiah 29, verse 13, the Lord said, Because these people draw near with their mouth, honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. They approach God with their, uh, with their lips and with offerings, but their heart is far. Psalms 141. Captured it right. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. This is a prayer uh, by David when he was unable to uh, worship at a temple, to be at the temple of God. He said, Lord, wherever I am, let my prayer be counted as an incense. Let the lifting of my hands be as, as the sacrifice, be as worship unto you. And even as... Uh, as we close, you know, God is interested not at any location, but at our hearts, at the condition of our hearts. And we can worship in spirit, through the Holy Spirit. And we can worship in truth. And we need to come back daily, just come back to the heart of worship. We need to ask ourselves, Lord, what is the heart of worship? What is the true meaning, why is the reason I worship you? And if we can answer that in our hearts, it will set a right tone, a right trajectory. Even um, it's a good time to remind ourselves, Lord, no matter what happened, this COVID-19, the economy is not right, you know, my, uh, even children may not be going to school at this time, may, be, uh, may affect their studies. Let us come to worship God, not because of things around us, but because He is worthy of our adoration and our love. Amen. Amen, church. Right, why don't we just uh, close in, in prayer. Lord, we are made to worship You and You alone. Ignite in our hearts, in our spirit, Lord, the desire to worship. I pray, Lord, for all of us, all those who are listening, Lord, you ignite the first love and you refresh us, Lord. There are those who may need your refreshing, young and old, Lord, who need your touch. I pray that you will even touch them right now, Lord, even as we uh, worship, or yeah, even as we worship, Lord, with this song. We thank you, Lord. Praise you. Amen.
There's no darkness in your way, so have your way. Lord, have your way.